Hello, Gareth Owen. Welcome to the Juno Files. Well, thank you, Jim. Nice to be here. Now, your new book is called Raising an Eyebrow. Now, this is the story of you being Sir Roger Moore's personal assistant for the last 23 years of his life. But yeah, you, it, it, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it sounds quite daunting when you say it like that. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it was never a book I was going to write, to be honest, because I, I think when you're a, a personal assistant and I developed into being a personal manager with him, really, uh, obviously you keep things very confidential. You don't want to talk about things that might possibly uh, embarrass his family. But I, I sort of began to realise that there are so many fun stories, so many great times we had together, so many places we went together, so many things we did together. And I, I'd sort of start chuckling sometimes. And, you know, and friends encouraged me and they said, look, you've got to write these stories down because they're fun, they're warm, they're, they're stories that people would like to hear. So really, the book is a tribute. It's, it's a very warm love letter in a way i suppose you might say and uh you know he was a great friend of mine as well as being my boss and uh i, I really wanted to show another side to him because he was a very kind man he worked very hard behind the scenes for all sorts of good causes and uh, and he had a loving family behind him and uh, that really and particularly his wife you know his wife was his world so it, it was nice to show that side of him too you, you mentioned something that leads me to my next question is that, yes, you were a personal assistant, but like you said, you were actually friends, you were actually good friends with him. Which... Yeah, uh, yeah, we, 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 it helped that we shared the same very naughty sense of humor, I think. <laughs> and he was never afraid of winding me up or embarrassing me in a nice way. Mm -hmm. And so I became a little cheeky towards him. And that kind of endeared us to each other because I wasn't sitting at his feet hero worshiping him all the time. And, and I would be honest with him and he'd say, how's my hair looking? And I'd say, to be honest with you, you're pretty bad. And he'd say, right, okay. And off he'd go and do it. Uh, I wouldn't just sit there and say, wow, you're wonderful, Roger. I think you're, you're, you know, everything about you is fantastic. And so we were always honest with each other and, and a friendship developed from that. And you know, he called me up for a chat just about everyday things and sometimes I have a, a bit of a moan and complain about things and particularly about old age and how he hated the fact his knees weren't working anymore. And he's, you know, he would say, crikey, you know, I had to travel to this place and then there were 12 stairs. I had to travel 12 stairs to get up to the studio. And uh, yeah, so I guess really we were towards the end of his life. Certainly we were the best of friends. You uh, now you mentioned his sense of humor. Now, I remember watching him on on like shows like the Johnny Carson Tonight Show and things of that nature. He always had, I guess you share it too, a penchant for the naughty jokes, the dirty jokes. The oh yeah, you know, school it's schoolboy humor, really. Mm -hmm. You know, he he was never offensive to anybody, but it was naughty schoolboy behavior and those silly little jokes and quite rude jokes at times. <laughs> but it would in a way it was disarming because you know he would walk onto a film set for instance and there'd be a hundred pairs of eyes looking at him and he'd feel this great pressure and so the best way of breaking that atmosphere was telling a dirty joke and then everybody would sort of say oh dear this man's quite funny isn't he and he did that when we were touring on his theatre show you know they'd say would you come in and do a sound check and of course at the back of the theatre you'd have all the studio all the theatre management you know and all the the ushers and all the people who were involved with the production and they say, Rod, you know, what did you do this morning? You know, did you get up? What did you have for your breakfast? You know, give me some, give me some words. And he'd say, I got up and had a very rude dream. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I cleaned that up a little bit. But it, it just immediately endeared him to everybody. And, and that's, you know, I, I share that. I'm, I'm very silly at times. And, and I think that endeared us to each other because we kind of knew what each other was thinking and where the joke was going to come. I remember correctly in the book, you say that one of your first emails to him was a rude joke. Mm, yeah. Which he appreciated. Well, he did because, again, you know, how do you introduce yourself to someone who's about to become your boss? Um, do you say it's, it's going to be a, an, an honor to work with you, sir? Uh, it's going to be a privilege to work with you. Or do you just say, I'm really looking forward to working with you. Here's a rude joke to get us going. And, and that really established, if you like, the, the relationship between us, that it was going to be professional, but it was going to be fun. Now, you mentioned in your book also that you, know, you, didn't, not, you didn't just meet Roger Moore. You met uh, 
we met uh, Desmond Llewellyn, and yeah, and um, also uh, Walter. Is it Walter? Uh, uh, yeah, w Walter Gotel. I mean, the, I mean, I grew up watching the Bond films. So the Bond films to me were everything. Yeah. And w Walter Gotel played the Russian general Gogol in about I think six or seven of the movies, and Desmond Llewellyn played Q, the gadget master. And I became friends with Desmond. I became friends with Walter. In fact, I, I, I rented a, a room in his apartment for a year when I first moved down to London. And um, they were great people. They, they, they were great storytellers. And, you know, for me, a young boy coming into the film industry, not only lodging with an actor who's worked with Humphrey Bogart on The African Queen and who's been in six or seven Bond movies and talks about working with great directors. And then you've got Desmond Llewellyn, a fellow Welshman, talking about all the gadgets in the Bond films and how they never worked and how they always went wrong. <laughs> and, you know, absolutely fascinating. And, and so I was very lucky to get to know these people. And through them, I met very, I mean, I remember meeting Sean Connery. Um, I was at a memorial service with Walter Gotell. We went to the director Terence Young's memorial service. And Terence Young directed three of the Bond movies. And Terence, you know, was someone I never really knew, but I appreciated. And Walter said, you know, Sean, don't you? And he said, Sean, you're, you're going back to Pinewood this afternoon. Would you give Gareth a lift in your car? And I, I was dumbstruck. And Sean Connery looked at me and he said, I'm ever so sorry, but we're going off to a location in St Albans. I'm not going back to Pinewood, uh, but nice to meet you. And I, I, you know, I was, what, 21, 22 years of age. And I thought, my goodness, it's Sean Connery, who appears to be about eight foot tall. I mean, he's a tall guy, but when you meet him, he's got this air of, I don't know, there's, there's, there's this sort of real charisma. And he appears much taller than he actually is, and you find yourself looking up to him. And um, it was a world I wasn't used to, but it was a world I'd been submerged into, and, and I absolutely found it fascinating and really good fun. I remember you telling how uh, Desmond Llewellyn, being the gadget master Q, but he himself, in real life, was a bit of a, a nerd when he came oh, to... Oh, he... he <laughs> Desmond was a technophobe. He hated yeah. technology. And I remember I stayed with him one weekend. Um, he lived down on the south coast of England. And he was trying to set up a VCR machine. This shows you how long ago it was. He was trying to set up a VCR machine to record a program that night. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, this guy's obviously got the latest technology. He's obviously got everything. He's a wizard. And he said, how the hell do I get this machine to program? I want to record this show and I'm recording the wrong channel. What the hell am I doing wrong? And Desmond had these great big hands. They were gardener's hands. He loved to garden. And his hands were massive like spades. And so the tiny little buttons, he had to get a toothpick to sort of pick at them because he couldn't actually get his fingers into the, into the little gap. And, um, you know, t totally the opposite to what you see on screen where he's briefing Bond about the latest gadget or the latest car, how to operate it, and what, the, you know, you press this button here and that causes this to pop open and then that explodes. And he always had difficulty remembering his lines as well. And, and this is where Roger's naughty sense of humour came in because Roger would see Desmond strolling around the set trying to commit these lines to memory. And he'd say to the director, what, you know, what, what time are we shooting with Desmond today? He'd say, oh, after lunch, after lunch, okay. And during the lunch hour, Roger would go away and rewrite his scene, and he would rewrite the dialogue, <laughs> ask the script supervisor to type it up, then present it to the director and say, uh, John or Lewis, th these are uh, Desmond's new lines. And so the director would say, oh, Desmond, dear boy, Desmond, come on, um, we've had a rewrite here, your new lines. Now, he'd already spent an hour and a half learning this most technical gibberish you've ever seen written. And Roger has written even worse gibberish. And, you know, are we ready? Ready to go? Hang on a minute. And you'd see, Roger said you would see the panic in Desmond's eyes as he's trying to sort of commit this, 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 this sort of gibberish, this absolute rubbish to his memory. And Roger said, I did that to him seven times. And he never twigged each time he was presented new dialogue. He never questioned it. He just went with it. And he said, it wasn't until I started giggling during the take that Desmond would actually realise I'd done it to him again. And, and he said, you know, nobody could hit me because I was the star. So he couldn't, you know, he couldn't get a soda siphon or a hose pipe and soak me with water because I was the star and I couldn't get wet in my suit. He said, so I was untouchable. And uh, that, that, you know, those are the sort of schoolboy pranks he would play. And, yeah, he, he was quite cruel, but in a fun way.
that was going to ask. That's what I was going to ask you also. Him, him taking over from Sean Connery. He looked like Roger Moore brought, had so much fun playing the character of James Bond. Well, you know, Roger always said you can't imitate another actor. He said, you know, there are countless actors who've played all sorts of roles on stage, like, you know, Henry V, Othello, um, Romeo and Juliet, been played by all sorts of actors. And he said, and if you come in saying, I'm going to play it like Laurence Olivier, for instance, he said, you're doomed. So you should never come to a part like Bond and say, well, I have to play it like Sean Connery, because that's what they're expecting. He said, I can't play it like Sean Connery, because I will be imitating him. I can only play it like Roger Moore would play it. And I, you know, he said, I've read the books. I've sort of gained nuggets of information about the character that I think worked for me. And the one line that stuck with him from the Fleming books was that James Bond was a killer, but he didn't particularly like killing. Mm -hmm. And Roger said, well, this tells me this is a man, he's an assassin, doesn't particularly like it. Therefore, he can't be that ruthless. He can't be that cold. And so that gave Roger a little bit of a, a clue to what sort of character he should be. And, and of course, over the years, he injected more of his own sense of humour, I suppose, which the directors allowed him to do because they said, make the part your own. Because after all, the public are coming to see your version of Bond, not you playing Sean Connery, imitating Bond. And, you know, he, he, I think he did it quite well. I mean, some of the films are a bit far-fetched in places, I know that. But for the time, Moonraker came out in 1979. This was, you have to remember, this was at the time where Star Wars was in the cinemas. Close Encounters had just been made. Everything was about space. And so it made sense to send James Bond to space. You know, if you try that today and you have James Bond in a, a sort of a silver spacesuit firing laser guns around, you think this is a bit crazy. It's a bit far-fetched. But that's what the public wanted at the time. And Roger just rode that wave. He was quite happy to give the public what they wanted and maybe even a bit bigger and a bit more than they wanted. And, and I think it worked. You know, his films were hugely popular. They made a lot of money. He made seven of them. And, uh, you know, he, he, he's the first to admit that Sean Connery is the better Bond because he said Sean created the role. Sean defined the role on the screen. Mm -hmm. He said, but I like to think I added my own little touches, my own little flair to it. And at a time where people wanted that sort of humour, that they wanted those sort of movies, he gave it to them. So... Um, I think he was very astute, and, and, and certainly he, uh, he made sure each time he earned a little bit more on the back end of the movie, so he wanted to make sure they did well. Did he have a favourite Bond movie of his own? Yeah, you know, it's a question he was asked all the time, really, and he would always say, The Spy Who Loved Me. It was his third film. He'd settled into the part. He was working with Lewis Gilbert, who he loved and adored, and he said the great thing about that film was that it had the most fantastic opening sequence where he, uh, not he, but his stunt double parachutes off a cliff. And then uh, as he falls, the Union Jack parachute opens and he comes to safety. You had the underwater Lotus Esprit. Uh, you had Jaws as the villain with the metal teeth and wonderful locations. And he said, for me, that film just had it all. And it had the music, you know, nobody does it better as the theme song. And he said, for me, everything just came together. Everything clicked with that film. And he looked pretty good in it. And so working with Lewis Gilbert was really, you know, that was the, the absolute cream on the cake, if you like, because he said Lewis was so great as an actor's director because he would say, what do you think about this? You know, do you think this works well or do you think you might like to do it a different way? And he would really collaborate. And, and Roger said, you know, to have a director like that who's willing to say, I don't think this line sounds very good in the script. What do you think about it? He said, for an actor, that's wonderful to have that sort of, uh, you know, that guidance and that ability to work with your director to better something. And so, yes, yeah, Spy Who Loved Me was always his favourite. I saw him late in his career in a movie called Spice World. <laughs> <laughs> And um, that wasn't a Bond film, <laughs> far from it. But uh, the character, let me ask you, what character that he played, whether it be James Bond or Folks or, or the guy in Spice World, which um, personified uh, him? Yeah, you see, now, he, there's a movie called Folks you just mentioned. He loved that because he said, I loved playing a sexist misogynist because it's so against caste. 
that you know so against type that he usually gets cast in those sort of roles and he said you could be deliciously rude and and he said and i just love that because you know i could snap at women and say you know do you mind putting that cigarette out and don't sit in this carriage thank you and he said i would never do that in real life and so that was quite good fun spice world was a movie he did simply because they offered him one day's work it was the the movie that the spice girls made mm -hmm. uh, they offered him one day's work and they paid him a huge amount of money and he said well you know what can i do the script is not particularly great but if someone knocks on my door and offers me a, a you know a briefcase full of money for one day's work i'm not going to turn it away um so he loved a good script but at the same time if somebody offered him a business opportunity he couldn't turn down he grabbed it but certainly he loved folks he loved the wild geese because that was a great action adventure movie working with richard burton richard harris hardy kruger great director andrew v mclaglan and he also loved making a movie not very well known outside the UK called The Man Who Haunted Himself, which he made around about 1970. And um, it, it was a, an original story, a uh, short story, which was developed into a feature, which is basically about a man who discovered he had a doppelganger. And the doppelganger slowly but surely took over his life, took over his family, took over his friends, took over his work. And Roger played these two parts, uh, you know, the good guy and the bad guy. And it was a really quite dark role in many respects. And, you know, to play two parts, to play a good guy, to play a bad guy, uh, he relished that. And he said it was the one film he was really allowed to act without having to play the usual type of hero, like Simon Templer or James Bond. You know, he wasn't the action hero. He was a vulnerable, gullible character. And uh, his life was crumbling in front of him. So he loved that. He always said that was his most... I suppose his proudest moment as an actor. Um, but otherwise, you know, he, he worked with uh, Lee Marvin in a movie called Shout at the Devil, which he absolutely loved because it was such a fun movie to make. Um, he made The Sea Wolves with a great ensemble cast, including Gregory Peck and David Niven. These were all mates of his. And so to come together and have a sort of playtime and be paid and get sent home at the end of the day you know have with these wonderful memories and a paycheck in your back pocket and the opportunity to work with your mates you know to him he absolutely adored it so so many movies he loved i mean he never never resented never resented anything at all that um you know he did because you know unlike michael kane he wouldn't say oh i i did that purely for the money and nothing else he would say, look, I did it for the money, but I did it because I wanted to do it. It was fun. It was something I enjoyed doing. And to him, movies, that was most important. Those were movies he loved doing. Did he ever not do a movie that he, that he regretted not doing? Um, there was one movie he really, really wanted to do. And he pursued the director, not vigorously, um, but it was a movie called Day of the Jackal, oh, yeah. directed by Fred Zinnemann. And he'd read the book by Frederick Forsyth and he knew that Fred Zinnemann was putting the movie together. And he said, I would really love to play the Jackal because I think it's such a great part. And Fred Zinnemann wouldn't see him. Fred Zinnemann wouldn't sort of, you know, have him in for a chat or anything. And Roger didn't know why. And he said it was about five, ten years later, he met Fred Zinnemann at a cocktail party or a reception or something. And he went over to him and he said, look, do you, do you mind me asking? Um, I really wanted to do that movie, but you wouldn't see me. Why? And Fred Zinnemann said, I'll tell you exactly why. He said, you're six foot two. You're dashing. You're good looking. You look like a hero. The jackal has to be anonymous. He has to blend into a crowd. He has to disappear into a crowd. You wouldn't. And so you weren't right for the part. And Roger said, yeah, I get that. I accept that. Absolutely. He said, and Edward Fox was brilliant. So that was one film that really, I won't say upset him, it didn't upset him, but it was a film that he really wanted to do, but didn't get the chance. Uh, he turned down a lot of stuff because he felt the scripts weren't very good. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, he was quite principled because he would also say, I have to think about my image as a UNICEF ambassador. And I, if I'm in some sort of cheap sex comedy, what does that do for my image as a fundraiser, as someone who goes out to speak for children, who is there as an ambassador traveling the world, raising funds for UNICEF? 
And so he would say, sometimes he would read a script and say, I can't do this because the part, you know, it wouldn't fit in with UNICEF. Uh, so he was, he was quite disciplined in that respect. You, you know, you led me on to my next question about him being a UNICEF ambassador. That looked like a, that role was very important to him. Mm. It dominated the last 25 years of his life. Mm. Uh, because in the early 90s, Audrey Hepburn, who was a friend of his, phoned him up and said, um, I'm hosting the Danny Kaye uh, Children's Awards in Amsterdam. And I wondered if you would come and co-host with me. It would be wonderful. It's all in aid of UNICEF. And Roger said, well, you know, you don't say no to Audrey Hepburn, do you? You know, you, you, yes, of course, Audrey, I'd love to. And he said, so what day is it? And she said, Saturday. He said, OK, so if I get there for, say, Friday night, we'll do the shows. She said, no, no, no. I want you to come in a couple of days before because we're going to do some press conferences and publicise it and talk about it. And Roger said, well, I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know much about UNICEF. It's a bit embarrassing. And she said, just come, because all they'll want to do is talk to you about movies and talk about James Bond. And because Roger went to this press conference, it was absolutely packed, of course. The room was packed with journalists. And every journalist started asking about James Bond and his movies. And Audrey Hepburn would turn it back round to UNICEF and say, well, you know, that's great. That's fantastic. The reason we're here. And Roger saw her passion. And he saw the way that he became embroiled through Audrey Hepburn in this world, really. And he said, I could see that she was, in a way, grooming me to take over from her. And, and he said, you know, I wanted to know more. And the only reason um, I wanted to know more was because I wanted to get more involved. And to get more involved, I would have to be out there in the field. I would have to do visits. I would have to do field trips. And that's really when he became very, very passionate because he saw firsthand how children were starving, how children didn't have clean drinking water, how children were dying from present preventable diseases. And, you know, and he would say, you know, malnutrition in children shouldn't be happening. Children shouldn't be starving. Children shouldn't be dying of dysentery. Uh, there's all these preventable diseases that UNICEF were fighting to try and bring to people's attention. And he became so, so passionate. And he literally traveled the world for years and years and years, fundraising, raising awareness, meeting prime ministers, meeting presidents, meeting kings and queens. And he said, you know, the thing is, UNICEF can't ordinarily get to decision makers. They can't necessarily get to meet presidents. They can't get to meet kings and queens. He said, but every leader has children and every leader's children likes James Bond. So when they know that I'm around and would like to meet, they say, yeah, that would be great. You know, come and have afternoon tea, come and have lunch because our children would love to meet you. And he would do what Audrey Hepburn did. He would talk about that, but then bring it back to UNICEF. And that's the way he used his fame, uh, if it can be sort of called fame, but he used his notoriety, his celebrity for good use. And, you know, up until his dying day, he was so passionate about UNICEF and if he couldn't go on the trips anymore, he would write speeches, he would record all sorts of messages, he would write letters, he would send emails, and he would front fundraising campaigns. So, you know, anything and everything he could do, he did. And uh, very, very passionate. Well, Gareth Owen, I really appreciate you taking time. The book is Raising an Eyebrow, uh, about your time, your, your life with, with uh, Roger Moore. Sir Roger Moore, I'll make sure I get that. <laughs> Thanks. He was very modest, actually. He, uh, when people said, do we call you sir? He would say, only if you owe me money. <laughs> uh, but, you know, on a film set, making movies, making TV, making commercials, he would say, everybody is the same. And if we can't be on that same level where you're John, you're Bill, I'm Roger, he said, we can't work, can we? Because if you're in awe of me and you're calling me Sir Roger or Mr. Moore, no, he said, that doesn't work. We're all on the same playing field here. And, uh, and that's what endeared him to so many people, I suppose, because he was so down to earth and uh, very normal and would make time for everybody. And I'm sure, Jim, if you bumped into him in the street and say, hey, Roger Moore, how are you? He'd stop and say, fine, how are you? Can I have a photo? Sure you can. What do you do? What do you... And he, he would give somebody a minute of his time. And I would always say to him, that one minute will stay with them for the rest of their lives. 
and they'll remember the day they met Roger Moore. And he used to laugh and he'd say, yes, of course they'll remember the day they met me. And he'd just brush it off. Um, but it's true. I've met people since he, he's passed away who've said that, you know, I, I met him. He signed an autograph for me. He signed a book for me at a book signing event. And, uh, and it still lives with them. So it's, it's really nice to hear that. Well, thank you again for being here. And thank you. Gareth Owen, raising an eyebrow. Thank you again. Thanks, Jim.